Well, good morning, everybody. I think we'll get started here. Um, thank you for joining us. My name is Karina Lepp, and I work with the Manitoba canola growers here in Rivers, Manitoba. And this morning's uh, webinar is on minimizing harvest loss this season. And we're really looking forward to the panel discussion that we have uh, lined up. And um, our moderator this morning is Jay Wetter with the Canola Digest. He's the editor of the Canola Digest with the Canola Council of Canada. And um, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, everybody is muted. Questions and we encourage questions. If you wanna type them into the Q&A um, box during uh, the presentations, we will have a 20 minute question and answer period where we'll answer all those questions at the end of the webinar. And uh, feel free to chat amongst yourselves as well with the chat function. So I think that with, I think that's all the housekeeping things. I'll uh, welcome Jay to our, our meeting and we'll get our webinar started. Hi everybody, thanks Karina. Yeah, I'm Jay Wetter with Canola Digest and I've been a farm journalist for almost 25 years. And I'll just be helping with the Q&A primarily and running through that part of it. And I'm also introducing the three speakers today. So we're gonna kick off with Sean Senko. Sean's a colleague of mine. He's an agronomy specialist with the Canola Council of Canada. He started uh, March 2011, so he just passed his 10 years with the Council. And before that, he worked in canola research and development, as well as the animal nutrition industry. And his areas of expertise are weeds, harvest management, and equipment technology. So the harvest and equipment side is uh, what we'll be talking about today. Sean is also currently involved in the family farm near Guernsey, Saskatchewan. He's based out of Sask uh, Saskatoon primarily. And just a little side note, uh, Sean has a pretty dry sense of humor, but he's uh, one of the funniest guys I know. I'm not sure he'll say any jokes today, but uh, keep your ears peeled. And then uh, we've got Marcel, Marcel Kringer, who's the founder of Bushel Plus. That's a Manitoba-based company that developed a drop pan and combine calibration system. Marcel was born and raised on a small mixed farm in Germany and he worked for a German combine manufacturer and several farming and custom contracting businesses around the world before settling in Manitoba as a technical agronomist. And Marcel's drive to start Bushel Plus was to help farmers measure losses in a safe way and put more grain in the bin. And Neil Smith, uh, Neil is the pre vice president of business integration at Bushel Plus. He grew up with horticulture on the West Coast and has been immersed in broad acre row crop and horticulture agriculture on the prairies for the past 15 years. Neil has worked in almost every facet of agriculture and has a lot of experience on the manufacturing side. And at Bushel Plus, his goal is to help farmers achieve results through a focus on harvest efficiencies. So Sean, uh, we'll kick off with you for 20 minutes or so, and then we'll get on to Marcel and Neil, and then Q&A after that. So yeah, like Karita said, put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom and uh, I'll work through as many as I can at the end. Okay, thanks Jay. I'll just get my presentation up and running here. Okay, can we see that? Looks good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay, thanks. Um, so yes, I'm Sean Senko with the Canola Council of Canada, um, one of the agronomy specialists, and one of my areas especially is um, harvest management, so I'll be covering um, part of this harvest losses here. So what, um, what we'll be going through, the outline is, um, you know, why do we see losses in, in the field, and, you know, why do we tend to see more losses than we'd like to see? Um, you know, what are the losses? So looking at a couple of research projects that have been done to, um, to measure these losses and what we've seen from those results. Uh, the tools we've got, so our um, online tool to help measure as well as some of the simple tools and equipment needed to, to do a measurement yourself. Um, one of the other panelists will be talking about more about the, um, the safer and um, you know, easier to use tool system. And then at the end, I'm just going to touch on something new with losses as well, uh, the shatter rating system for canola um, that's just being developed. So to get started, um, why do we see the losses? So one of the reasons is there's more than two times the, the combine horsepower since 1990. 
as an example, um, you know, I've got I have a few different combines, a 94 um, that's putting out 260 horsepower, um, a 2004 that's putting out 370. Um, you know, in that same cleaning system in that combine um, today, uh, it's the same system. It's putting out close to 600 horsepower. So there's, there's a lot more power in these combines and not um, the processing cleaning capacity hasn't kept up as much. Power can be useful in things, you know, like wet conditions, large headers in those wet conditions or lots of hills, but many times we've got more power than we need. So simply put, you can put way more material um, through the combine than it's capable of um, handling. And that's where we tend to see those, those losses. So power does not equal capacity. Capacity is how much material you can put through that combine, keeping it at a specific loss level. Uh, another reason for, for uh, lots of losses is over reliance on that loss monitor. So just assuming that if you if you're watching the loss monitor that you're good and that loss monitor is going to be accurate. So um, without actually checking and um, being able to uh, quantify that to the loss monitor, um, it's not very accurate. Uh, so here, this is a graph developed by Tammy, um, and we tend to say that you know under two percent is the ideal combining capacity, two uh, percent losses. And here we can see on the on the bottom axis we've got ground speed, and on the, the y axis um, grain loss as a percentage of yield. So when we talk about two percent, right in here is our two percent loss. You can see with a mile an hour gain, we're losing just under one percent um, extra. But if you go up the next mile an hour from four to five miles an hour, um, we've actually gone two and a half. Um, percent more losses. So once you start to, to push the combine, losses grow quite exponentially. Um, you know, it, it, ideally, you should, you should keep it at 1%, but there's also that efficiency. Combines, um, you know, machinery is not cheap and we need to get something done per unit um, of our uh, work done. So that's why we tend to stay in the 2% range. It's, it's kind of the, the mix of best efficiency of the combine and lowest losses. For combining. There are times, um, you know, 2% is ideal. Um, rain, big wind event coming, um, we may want to push those combines faster. Um, that's going to be up to the producer. But under most conditions, 2% and under is ideal. Example, some of the lost projects that we've seen. Um, so this is one of the older ones done by Rob Goulden out of uh, Manitoba. So this was in 2010 to 2012 across four sites. And um, what he found was, you know, just over that 2% to 8% um, loss across these sites, an average of about 5.9% is, um, is what he was seeing. Um, typically higher combine ground speed um, was, was tied to the increased harvest losses. And uh, the manufacturer type of the combine or whether it was a rotary or conventional combine um, didn't really factor into that um, that loss. So, so we didn't see, from work done 10 years prior to this, we didn't see any reduction in harvest losses. So um, they were both the same. Uh, another project that um, was done just in 2019. So PAMI went across Western Canada um, behind 50 combines and measured losses. And what they saw was in that, um, 0.2 to 4.1 bushels per acre, which equates to about half a percent, all the way up to almost 11% uh, losses. Um, the average loss was 1.3 bushels per acre or 2.8% of the yield. Um, temperature, time of day, really environmental conditions is what um, contributed a lot to the difference in losses. So it really shows it's key to check that combine more than just once. Like you want to, you want to be checking the combine throughout the day. Um, as the environmental conditions change, um, the way that material moves to the combine, the way it's separated, how much will stay in the cleaning system and how much will be up in the separating system will definitely change. So that was the most important um, factor they found in, in how much those losses come about. I'm just gonna point out that um, you can see this is, these are, if you wanna know more about these particular projects, the Canola Research Hub is someplace you can go as well as any canola um, related research. Um, there's, there's lots of information on the research hub. So feel free to, to check that out. So that's what we've seen in losses. So now I'm gonna talk about 
and going out and actually measuring your own losses. So just the, the simple kit you need to, to measure losses. And here's an example of um, what I managed to find around the shop. I've got way more than this. And I usually tell producers, make sure before harvest starts, you've got your kit made. It makes it simpler and it'd be much more, be more enticed to, to actually check losses. So um, I need to find the rest of my kit here. Um, usually what I tend to use is a larger plastic container. Um, you can find in Walmart or, or any place like that. Really lost pan size doesn't matter, but you want something that you can easily um, place under the combine while it's uh, at its operating speed. So in the past, um, you know, including myself, a lot of producers have used shovels um, to check losses, but the problem with something like a shovel is depending how long you hold it under there, it's gonna change how much material you collect and you're not gonna have an accurate amount. Um, you can think you're actually making a, the proper change when all you've done is just pull the shovel in and out faster. So you need a pan that you can place under the combine while it's in motion um, and it'll pick up that point in time in that specific um, area. The other thing you'll need is a measuring device. So I'm gonna go through the, the app here right away and explain the different ways of measuring, but really for canola, um, the two ways is either the volume or the weight measurement. So I like the volume the best because it's it really takes no technology for that. All you need is something that'll re <clears throat> measure in either milliliters or cc. So like an old cattle syringe or something from the, the kitchen that can measure um, milliliters. Uh, you know, the, the weighing system is also a good system, but you'll need some sort of scale that can measure pretty low amounts. Um, they're easily picked up at like a sporting goods shop, a Cabela's, um, a battery operated one, or Amazon, um, you can order them from for under $50 for battery operated scale that work good for this. So you can use either the volume or the, the weighing. Um, cleaning supplies. So the, the very basic cleaning for something like this would be just simply shaking the pan, pulling the chaff off and continue shaking it and cleaning it and blowing till you can get yourself a sample that you can measure. Uh, it'll never get truly clean and in something like that chaff, when you're doing the volume measurement, it can throw your measurement out quite a bit. So I do like the, um, in the example here, you can see the round screens. Um, most trade shows you, farm trade shows you go to, there'll be a booth there. Um, Demo supply out of um, Winnipeg is where I've ordered most of mine from. Um, so it, it works good for getting the chaff on the sample for doing your, your actual measurement. It's also really good in a year like this when we've got um, rough conditions, a lot of, um, small seed so you want to get that dockage out because some of that seed might actually be simply dockage that you don't need to, um, to be trying to collect anyway so uh, a screen really helps in that regard to, to separate that sample and only keep the the actual canola that you'll be able to sell um, as a loss so you're measuring the proper amount but the other thing you'll need um, is a device so if you're using the app you'll need either a phone an ipad uh, your laptop, something in the, the field um, to use that. Or I've got um, an example coming up with the PAMI loss guide, which you can print off the Canola Council of Canada's website to, um, to take out the field if you're more comfortable using a, a paper guide. Um, the, the link under there just shows a video of, of how, what of everything I've talked about here on how to, to collect this sample. Um, and as well, it'll be in the uh, Canola uh, calculator here, which I will pull up right now to, to show. So here's the harvest loss calculator, and I'll do one run through on this. Um, there's a uh, few different examples we can go through, but um, so on the this is this is an easy way once you've collected that sample to measure that harvest loss. So the link right here, the the short video. That'll be the video that'll explain everything I've just shown you, how to collect that sample properly, how to place the pan, how to clean the sample, and, um, and get you ready to, to do this measurement. But what I'll do right now is just a quick example of how to do the, the app here. So uh, you can choose your crop. It actually works for all crops. Um, I'll choose canola here. Uh, you can choose whether you want imperial metric measurements. Um, and then the methods I mentioned. So there's the weight. If you've got a scale, um, probably your best system to use with a scale would be a weight. And the volume, which is the one I like because you, it's much easier to find a tool around the, the, the yard to, to do that. 
And the count method, which is something wouldn't really be used in canola because there'd be a lot of seeds to count. So I'm going to do an example of the volume method. So cut width, that would be your swath or your straight cut header width. So I'll put in 35. Uh, discharge width. So that's typically your sieve width. Um, it can vary in some combines. It, it's really what, how wide is the discharge coming out of the back of that combine? Typically in most combines, in conventional combine, your, the width of your walkers, the width of your sieve is the width that's coming out of the back of the combine. Same thing with a rotary. Um, sometimes it can be condensed a bit back. Um, really just measure that discharge and find out what you've got. So in the example, I'm going to put 60 inches in on this combine. Um, for the collecting area, so that's how many square feet is that pan you're collecting into. Um, so it really doesn't matter what pan size you use. It's whatever you're most comfortable throwing under there. So I'm gonna put an example in here of a three square foot pan. Um, the next is just for economics. So it helps you determine how much you're losing. So expected yield, um, you know, I'll put in 40 bushels, price per bushel. This is a tough one and you hear like this where, um, I guess at the moment I'll put in 20, because that's kind of where, where things are sitting. Um, and then the seed loss. So this is where it's going to um, vary on what you have put in there. So if you put in the volume method, it'll be in milliliters. Um, if you put in the weight method, it'll be in grams. So here, now you've collected your seed. You, you look at your, um, your loss in there. So I'll put in 30 milliliters. Um, so now the output's right on the side here. So we've got 85 pounds per acre loss, which equates to 1.7 bushels, and it's a 4.2% loss. Uh, the value is just under 35 bushels, $35 per acre loss. So something like this, we know that our losses are more than we want. Um, you know, like I said, typically that 2% loss. So uh, we want to start making combine adjustments to, to bring that down into a more acceptable loss. That would be the that's example for that. Um, I'll go back here. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the loss then when we created it was usable without a connection. Um, so we've been in the field once you download it once you won't need a connection. Um, Canola calculator.ca is where it's housed. You'll find a lot of very good apps on there, compatible with all systems. So whether you're running Apple. A Samsung or anything else, you'll be able to use the app and it's useful for all crop types. Um, if you don't um, want to use this uh, device out in the field, these PAMI and Canola Council developed um, pamphlets are available just from download from the Canola Council website. Um, and you can simply use this in the field instead. If you've got any issues going through it, just feel free to contact one of the agronomy specialists at Canola Council and we'll help walk you through using the, uh, the loss guide. One more thing, the combine optimization tool. So this is, if you've seen those losses and you can't figure out why you're seeing the losses in the field, um, you know, you're, or you're to get down to the losses, your productive, productivity is just too slow um, or your quality sample's not right. It's really a flow chart. Um, it'll take you through the different settings in the combine um, and you know, show you how to, to help set the combine. A lot of times, you know what, um, People are used to setting a combine, but um, different conditions can change it. I know in a year like this, you know, 95% of the time, I'll be telling producers slow down because um, you're overloading the combine. That's typical why I see too many losses um, due to the harsh conditions. You know, we've got some pretty thin crops out there. Um, you know, we, we may see rotor losses this year um, due to simply just not enough material in there um, to actually um, thresh that grain out. So, you know, one of the few times um, it may be um, acceptable to actually speed up the combine a bit and, and get more material and material threshing in there. Or um, things like fan speed can be an issue. You know, I've seen where producers call me because they're turning the fan down, they're still got material coming over the sieve and it's a bad sample and they can't figure out why there, there's still losses. Whereas actually um, the opposite needs to be done. You need to turn the, the fan speed up to lift that material off the, the sieve and um, have it clean. So it just, it, it can help you um, think of different um, problem solvings if you go through this uh, combine optimization tool. And one more thing I'm going to touch on is um, something coming out uh, that's going to help with losses as well is the shatter rating scale. So um, it's being worked on right now with the WCC RRC um, 
Voter Registration System uh, Subcommittee of that. So a one to nine rating system is going to be used um, and there'll be commercial hybrids as an example. So really just giving a, a rating on, on what we see on the, the varieties that are um, labeled as, you know, um, shatter resistant or, or harvest management varieties. So um, giving producers that one more key to know um, what they've got for, for shatter rating. Um, as well, we've got to watch a lot of education pieces coming out around this system. So, um, you know, some of the information around pod shatter versus pod drop, which we may see quite a bit of um, due to conditions this year and really understanding the difference. So um, uh, keep an eye out for the shatter rating scales uh, coming late this fall. Um, with that, um, that would be my portion of the presentation. Right on. Thanks, Sean. Okay, we'll move on to Marcel and Neil. And I think Marcel just uh, needs a minute to get his presentation ready. Uh, as I said before with Karina, um, uh, if you, if you're right, Karina said, and I repeated, if you have questions, uh, there's a button called Q&A. You can enter them into there uh, for the Q&A session. And so we'll get Sean and Marcel and Neil all together at the end for the Q&A. All right, and it looks like Marcel just about has his presentation loaded. And Marcel, do you want to check your audio there? Yes, hello. Can you hear and see me? Yeah, we can hear and see you. Good. Uh, so I'm going to sign off here and uh, let you do your thing, and I'll see you guys in about 15 minutes. Awesome. Yeah, right on. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Uh, it's Marcel here and Neil from Bushel Plus. Introductions were great. I'm going to jump right over those uh, because we have 15 minutes, a short time window to give you lots of tips and tricks for this upcoming harvest. Uh, quick agenda. It's This is really to, I want to invite you to think outside the box with me because this scenario is really not black and white. Harvest is different every day, um, every field. And uh, we're going through a few tips and tricks, what we see in the field the most to kind of condense this into the, the slides and then uh, have some of those revisiting in the Q&A questions later on. And this is a quick overview for the group discussions. And I thought we can bring to uh, the table what we hear a lot out there in, in the field and do some real life examples here. And we hear a lot out there that we don't need a pen for cereals or pulses. Canola is really our only thing. Um, or we can see the kernels on the ground, even a lot of times canola will still get assessed on the ground, but it's really hard to see on the ground. And the quality check in, in the grain tank and on the ground is really tough to do. And uh, we really found that it's an eye-opening experience in the words of our customers, that once they start using drop pen systems, especially ones that make it safe, easy, and quicker for you to use. Because uh, we all know if it's not quick and easy, nobody wants to do it. Everything is going a million mile an hour at harvest. I know that myself, if that combine stands for one minute, it feels like an hour. Um, that was one of the things why we put so much thought into our system. So it is quick and easy. And some of those eye-opening experience were really side by side where the farmer dropped the pan but then looked beside it on the ground and thought, you know, looks on the ground like I always harvested the last 20 years. Yeah, I would just keep going. But then he analyzed what was in the pan and he came out with about 8% harvest loss. And 8% harvest loss is really something we don't want to see as Sean nicely showed on those charts. Also looking on the ground, finding smaller broken kernels, which are also our loss, is hard to see because sometimes we have cracked ground already where kernels fall in or we don't even look for those cracked kernels on the ground. Um, cracked kernels in the, in the grain tank, we have a shaker box for that. I'll get into this a little bit more here once we talk about the sieves and the returns. So, and I always talk in those harvest clinics that we do about the three C's because reducing harvest loss really starts before harvest. Um, and it's this air seeder example that I have. Before we start talking about harvest, let's talk about seeding. You know, we have our air seeders, planters, sprayers, we calibrate those machines, uh, over half a million dollar machines, and we need to properly calibrate those, those things in order for them to do a good job. Otherwise, it's tough for us to even talk and compare settings out in the field or on Twitter, because it's tough to do with a non-calibrated combine. And there's some pre-harvest prep we can do that 
Uh, you may laugh about this, but a lot of times this is not being done. And even combines going through dealer shop, coming back, some have not been done. Any kind of color, we've seen it all in different countries. And it's so important that you calibrate your concaves and you calibrate the sieves the way it is in the user manual. Simple reason for that is if you're sitting in the cab and it shows, the, the display shows you the sieve is at 12 and 18, uh, you want to make sure it is at 12 and 18 in the back because if the sieve is actually on four, but it shows you on the display it's at 12, you can change whatever you want in the cab and the sample won't get better and the losses won't get better either. So same thing, concave sieves pre-harvest and then at harvest, what we're getting into now is calibrating the loss sensor because the loss sensor display doesn't really tell us anything if it's not benchmarked. If I don't know that if the benchmark, sorry, if the, if the meter goes up by a third or by a quarter, that this is about equal to a quarter or half or two bushels out the back, then, then it's calibrated. That's my benchmark. But if I don't check what's going out the back while my gauge is going up half or three quarters, I have no idea if that gauge is going now from half a bushel loss to two or from two to five. So I can also just turn the sensitivity down and feel good all day, but this is really not what we are what we have this system for. And then those self-setting combines, they're not self-setting combines. They still need to calibrate, you still need to calibrate the harvest loss sensor for the simple reason that those self-setting computers are still going by those sensors. So the sensor is only as good as the person setting it or as smart as the person setting it. And as you can see here, that counts for any kind of combine out there, even the 1915 IH with the three horses that we've been using for some of our marketing stuff up to the brand new self-setting combines. It is the same since the invention of the combine. That is just something we want to deal with. And we're doing it already with the air seeder. We are weighing when we're, we are weighing our sample when we are calibrating those air seeders in the springtime. Let's do this at harvest as well. Going into the harvest mode now, um, as I said, throwing a few tips at you here real quick. Uh, thrashing starts at the header for us. Um, it's so important that everybody talks about it. Let's feed it properly and evenly. Feed head in first. It sounds familiar, but do we really do this? If you think about it, how many times do we see bundles up on the draper, especially beside the feeder house on the sides where it tumbles a couple of times before it goes into the feeder house? Very, very important to set up those headers. Spend time with those user manuals. Spend time with your rep to set up those headers properly because once the crop goes wrong into the combine, not properly and slugs or in piles, the combine can't fix that anymore inside. It's super hard to thrash that. Uh, the better it comes into the front evenly, the better you can have grain on grain thrashing or straw on straw thrashing. Even the nods on the straw when they come in, they even help you thrash out grains um, on some of those other heads, um, which I get into in a little bit here about concaves. But let's make sure we have those headers set properly. We look at the crop flow, uh, fuel, wear parts. Imagine the guards and the knives. A lot of times those guards and knives are super worn out and you may not feel that sitting in the cab because you have lots of horsepower, as Sean said. But if you think about that, a foot of header takes X amount of horsepower and then you have 35, sometimes 40, 25 feet of header and it takes horsepower to drive that. If that's now dull, so if it's not sharp and it just rips those straws, uh, that really takes a lot of power and that takes thrashing power, horsepower away from it, takes power away from your chopper in the back. It really slows the machine down already right there and makes it harder for the machine to be fed evenly because you're not cutting and taking it on nicely. You're really just ripping the plant off and it falls already crooked onto the draper or into the auger. Very important, um, especially this year where the crops are a bit shorter, light or heavy crops. You may have to set the auger a little higher, a little lower. Uh, draper this year, you know, there's some pallets like a duck foot available in those light crops. Um, you wanna make sure you get that properly through nicely cut plants onto the draper into the auger. And then obviously into the feeder house where it's super important to have your chain adjustments checked out because imagine a chain that is in the feeder house that starts slacking in there. That is 
one of the areas in the combine where you start getting cracked grains from already. So sometimes when you look into your grain tank sample and you think, oh, that's my concave, look very, very closely where those kernels are broken. Are they broken right in half or are they broken on the sides? Because broken on the sides is more from the inside of the machine, but broken straight into the half is a lot of times an indicator that your feeder house chain is not properly tightened and that it's, that it's slacking as you're feeding the combine. Um, bulky crops, um, if you have a really heavy canola crop, it can help that the first drum can be adjusted higher. A lot of combines have that, they call it the corn mode. You can set the drum higher. So you create, if this is the feeder house here, um, I'm a visual kind of, I hope you can see my video. Maybe somebody give me some feedback on that. If you can put the drum up, you create a bigger triangle, then that goes into, into the feeder house uh, a little easier. And as I said already, if it's not fed evenly into the feeder house, the combine can't fix this inside. Um, going back through the combine here a little bit, you know, the even feeding and keeping the combine full is very important to get that proper grain on grain or straw on straw thrashing that I mentioned, because you want to you want to avoid the, the tough impact on the concaves or on the drum or on the rotor with those kernels. And you still need the RPMs in the centrifugal force, especially if you have tougher conditions. So just imagine you need the RPM, you need the centrifugal force to get those kernels out of the concaves, out of the rotor. And that's especially important to get thrashed out pods properly done in those pod shatter canola. Some of those pod shatter canola varieties, they are great, no doubt about it. They sometimes just thrash a little harder. We have heard that a lot of times from farmers out there. And it just needs a bit more time to adjust um, to adjust for that. And keeping the combine, when you slow down, think about it. You have such a gap that you have full of feed. And now if you slow down, you have less feed going through the concave. So you have to adjust it, make it either tighter. Or if you drive faster, you have to open it up more because there's more material coming through. So slowing down is not always my first choice because the last thing I want to do is slow the producer down. So there's things we can do with the rotor concave sieves to hopefully get you, keep you going at decent speed yet. But you need a system where it's easy and quickly check those losses and the combine performance really to get to that. Sieves, super important topic at canola. Uh, we often see in sieves on canola when we get called the seed in the field that they, they're set too tight and the wind is not high enough. And one of the problems is Sean, Sean mentioned this already that, um, that um, if you have not enough wind, not enough sieves, it's hard to blow the chaff up. So what's actually happening, the sieves, creating, um, the sieves are creating a barrier for the wind and the wind can't get through and lift up that chaff. So if you have closed up sieves, it just leads to um, the loss going with the chaff out of the back of the combine or even falling through onto the bottom sieve, where then if the bottom sieve is also closed, you don't have the wind coming through, you're filling up your return um, a lot more. And we can go through that a bit more, how we, run, how we can set that up in the questionary session. Um, running with a full return, be careful, especially in canola, because it's, it doesn't help you anything. Uh, it only kills performance. It puts grain that's thrashed already through the return, throws it back into the front, it kills your performance because you're rethrashing that grain and you end up with a lot more cracked grain because it spits it back out through the rethrasher or onto the drum and other ways. So be very careful with the return. And towards the end here, um, different modes of checking. This is probably a question that splits the world in half, um, but there is the Dropping versus spreading. How do I check my harvest loss? When should I do that? Um, so in our, with our system, there's a user manual with lots of tips and tricks. And this is a very important topic in that manual. Um, what we suggest from um, what we've seen out there is that you start dropping your straw and chaff in the windrow in the beginning, because that's the only way you can tell that those heads or those pods are threshed out properly by the concave and the rotor. Otherwise, if you just have those pots going through the chopper, the chopper will destroy them and will spread them back out. And you have a hard time determining if those pots are properly being threshed open. 
and you can set your harvest losses in a, in a, in a way to a scale that you like. But then if you switch it back to chopping mode, you got to be careful that you now change the wind physics on the back of the machine. And now this influences your harvest loss coming out the back, which now you have to recheck again. And as you can see a bit on the picture here, the best way to do this is dropping a pan in the middle of the machine and on the outside. All depends a bit on your chaff spreader setup. Our app makes it very handy and easy for you to help you guide you through this. We have if you see here on the left side, um, there is a solution for every situation. We have eight different chaff spread patterns in there. So we have eight different calculators just for the chaff spread. Uh, so it's very, very um, easy to dial it in for your situation. As you can see, you, you choose the chaff, you choose the rotor spread, and then you choose where you place your drop pen. Hit next, and then you can enter a couple details as in header with discharge with similar through what to what Sean was showing you earlier. And um, as I know I'm flying through this a little bit, uh, but this is a really cool feature where now you can enter the weight. We, we like weight because volume sometimes the, th the, thousand, uh, the thousand kernel weight will change. So our system comes with a scale. That's how you sell your grain. Really like the weight in this one. And then you can go by, here's where my first pan dropped. Here's what I found. Here's where my second pan dropped. This is what I found. And then the app will tell you exactly your bushel per acre loss in every spot, but also an average. And the new version now will even give you a performance overview where if you type in the yield, the commodity price, but then also the combine capacities in either acre per hour or bushel per hour, it will break it down to lost product per acre or lost product per hour. And I really like this lost, lost or dollar loss per hour because this is a, I think a new, uh, a new dimension we should be talking to because we can compare a lot better of losses and costs for the machine going per acre, going over the acre. Cause it's not just the loss, it's also the, the cost for the machine going over the acre here. Um, as I said, we are from Bushel Plus we came up with a remote control system that you can attach with magnets to the combine. We have a covered hood over our drop pan system so it doesn't fill up before you drop it for a sample, as you can see on the top left. Um, we have an air separator where you don't have to clean with uh, your sieves, so it's really 30, 40 seconds going through to clean because, again, all comes back to doing it more often, quickly, and more efficient. And the main thing is safe to save you more dollars per acre. And, Therefore, this is my 15 minutes. Uh, I put a lot in there just because I'm very passionate about this topic. Um, let's have some questions about it, some discussions, because we want to make farmers more profitable with safety first. And as you can see here, you go from eight bushel loss in oats to less than one bushel, and you do the same in canola. All this stuff adds up. I want to thank everyone um, today for joining. And you can find us on bushelplus.ca or you can find us on social media as well. And uh, thank you very much for your time today. Yeah, that was great, Marcel. Um, this is the kind of presentation that uh, probably deserves at least a one day uh, really in-depth session. So we're really skimming <laughs> the surface here. And, and I'll, I've got a bunch of questions. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to hog the Q&A. Um, people can enter their questions uh, using the Q&A button on the interface here. Uh, there's Sean, good. Okay, so I want to come back to a timely topic. And Marcel, we'll start with you and then we'll get to Sean and Neil. But um, so you, Marcel, you talked about grain on grain threshing and the importance of keeping the combine full. Uh, Sean talked about speed and then each combine will hit a kind of a threshold where losses increase. Anyway, we're looking at a bunch of thin crops this year. How do you keep the combine full enough um, that you're that we're not seeing losses or, or maybe comment on a 10 bushel per acre canola crop? Um, what what might the loss potential be? Um, and we may have to come back to this and talk to talk through this question, but I just want to make sure farmers come out of this with some senses on how how fast they need to combine a 10 bushel crop to keep the combine full for that grain on grain threshing. Marcel. 
Yeah, that, that is a great question. Tough, tough year for that. Um, kind of goes back to my slides. It really starts um, with the header. Uh, as Sean said, we have lots of horsepower. We can probably drive a lot faster than cutting hay in those crops. However, it really starts with guards and knives. We need to have the proper guards and proper knives. So when I mean they need to be sharp, they can't be worn out because they need to be cutting that crop quick, easy, so it properly falls back into the header. When I have the header set on a little bit of an angle that it can fall into. Otherwise, if they're not sharp, they really just rip it and it, it kind of falls to the side and gets bent into the guard. I, it's really, if I would have a guard here, I can show you exactly how it gets pulled into the guard and then rips instead of being cut. Um, so that's one of the important things there that you don't start pushing that crop in front of you. And then it really starts with, 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 um, with paddles, you know, that you have to get that crop in somehow. The, the normal header setup may not work this year as well as it has been in, in the past, as well as the angle where if you're able to, if you can set up your header a, a way that the crop can more fall into it instead of the crop has to fall up and into the combine. So this year, I think it's, it's even more important that we get those headers set up properly and that we talk to our reps and our user manuals or read the user manuals to get these in inside the combine. Um, as long as we get the heads or the pods, I should say, thrashed out properly in some of that pod shatter, it's, it'll be new for me as well to see some of that pod shatter after some of those, some of those um, drought conditions. Uh, we need to get the pods off uh, our and that's where you probably have to drop it in the windrow and start start with what you usually do and you most likely this year will run with a tighter concave or even have to look for a different set of concaves aftermarket that are really made for this there's a couple of companies that are really making hard thrashing concaves i'm not the biggest fan of hard thrashing but if it comes to pot shatter and really little bit of crops that can be very helpful as we've seen Sean, anything to add on that? And one? and go ahead, Marcel. And, and you need the speed to fill that gap. Yeah, sorry. And and then yeah. that hopefully will give you the speed to fill that gap between the concave and the rotor. Certainly, I'm talking best case scenario right now. It will be a tricky harvest. There's no doubt about it. Sean. Yeah. No. Thank you, Marcel. Have that uh, really well. It's. <clears throat> It's just key to keep that um you're trying to get the enough material to keep that um you know your cleaning area full and getting that grain and grain thrashing so um, yeah his tips really help to, to, to keep that going neil anything else you want to add there okay uh jump in if you want neil so uh, marcel i want to come back to um uh you know the calibration of the, the sieves to make sure your in cab uh, uh, dials are, are actually telling you what's going on and uh, monitors are telling you what's actually happening at the sieves and the concave and also the loss monitors it seems to get a bit complicated especially when you add in for this year you know uh, con you know aftermarket concaves or concave add-ons anyway in your experience, are, are most would it be better to go through your combine dealer and get them to to help help a farmer out in, in figuring out some of this stuff? Or is if you read your manual closely enough, is that good enough? I think your dealer of choice is definitely a, a great partner in this. And they they also have your, your best interest to get that crop off with that machine. Um, certainly that can be done, but I would start with the user manual and most of the combine user manuals that is described fairly well. Um, some combines are more complicated than others, and that's when you happily call the rep as well. Um, but it, it's really something if once you're used to it, depending on the machine can be anywhere from half an hour to an hour. It's really something that doesn't take too crazy long. Okay, so there's two separate concepts that I want to get to, but we do have a quick question from Frank, and I've got it up here on another screen. That's why I'm looking up and away. Um, Frank's just wondering, uh, 
whether there's an update. Oh, I think you answered that question. Okay, <laughs> it just, just went off my screen here, but was asking about updates to Bushel Plus. Do you guys wanna do a quick, if somebody already has one, is there an update? Yeah, no, we can't, there's, um, can't hear Neil. Neil, 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 Neil. <laughs> okay, Marcel, you go and then Neil jump in if you can. Okay, no worries. Yeah, uh, we have another update to our app that's very easy just to go in your app store and, and update the app to get the newest calculator, which is the intuitive drop pen placements that I showed. Um, we also, the new 2021 versions have uh, a new battery technology that, that we implemented. And um, on for courtesy, um, because we like our customers, we offered that to the past customers as well. And until the end of July, they were able to order those new batteries as what we call now an upgrade kit for free from us. It's not technically needed for them, but we want to supply it so they have the new technology that other people use as well going forward because those batteries will be, um, they'll be longer lasting in the future. And it was important for me that everybody has a great experience with it so people can get a hold of us, but it doesn't change the system it just gives you a, a battery that will probably last a little longer. One other quick question on the product itself. Um, Sean's asking, uh, do you make certain models for certain manufacturers? So is there is there a Bushel Plus specific to a combine brand or is it uh, brand agnostic? For the most part, it's brand agnostic. We have three different sizes by now that really we have a 40 inch flagship that is an and I say 40 inches, 40 inch wide, as in, as in crossing across the machine, 40 inch, or we have a 60 inch wide pen. It's really customer preference. The 60 inch was built for people that huh. Sorry, I think I just muted myself yeah. for a second. Yeah, so you're just um, about to talk sorry. about the 60 inch made for. Yeah. So the 60 inch is really made for people that like to do two things at a time. Uh, dropping straw and chaff in the windrow when you're checking for harvest loss. And if you want to cover the full width of the machine, it's just a customer preference that, that some people with a single rotor machine, for example, or they know some certain conditions in the field, they wanna have the full width of the sieves. However, the 40 inches of a flagship machine uh, or a flagship, um, system, I should say, uh, where you can have enough of an average sample from what's coming out the back that gets caught with this 40 inch pan. And what it's nice about that, it can be not just put underneath the axle, it can also be attached underneath the feeder house. If you have some higher canola stubble, tall hemp stubble, it's easier to put on, it's protected over there and it falls nicer down into some taller stubble conditions once you release the test pan out of it. You can also attach on the side of the header. So there is certain scenarios, um, but overall, give us a shout. We can walk you through it. Uh, for most farmers, the 40 inch is absolutely perfect. And then we have a 20 inch system for uh, plot combines. And then we work intensive in, intense with people in Australia on harvest weed seed control, where we talk about chaff lining, um, mills in uh, harvest weed seed control, where we're trying to manage resistant weeds at harvest. It's something that we will see here in the future, next five, 10 years as well in North America. But we are working with Australia on these special types of pans as well to not just measure harvest loss, but to also set these systems up properly so farmers don't have to spray uh, for or fight resistant weeds. All right, so I, I, you know what, we're gonna go, uh, I, I, I'm gonna save my questions. I do wanna get to them because they're they're kind of timely and interesting. Uh, but we do have a question from Franco who farms in South Africa. So Marcel, I know you've been in a lot of places. I'm not sure you've experienced farming in South Africa, but they swath all of their canola due to strong winds. Uh, that's a conversation in, in itself. Um, but anyway, uh, Franco is wondering uh, whether you recommend measuring the losses on the pickup before entering the combine. Have you got anything that'll do that? header losses, pickup losses? Hi, Franco. Uh, great question. Um, we do a lot of swathing as well here in Western Canada. And the nice thing with our system is that, you know, 
when you put the silver carrier onto the combine, regardless if it's on the back of the machine axle or underneath the feeder house, while you drop the red test pen that you saw in the pictures, it drops down onto the ground, the combine drives over it. And now the nice part is that everything inside the pen is losses from out of the combine. But when you lift up that pen now, when you lift it up, you can see that everything underneath it is either from the header or pre-harvest loss. So if you have straight cut canola, it might be pre-harvest loss. So you have to do a bit of tricky scouting for that. Uh, with a pickup, you most likely have a lot of pickup loss. Uh, de again, depending on your variety, on the weather, on the pickup setup, but there is there can be a lot of loss on that. But because our system basically does two things at once, um, that would be the best way to do it. Um, you can also do, it's a little trickier, but you can try to get the pan underneath the swath if you have some higher stubble and then try not, not to pick it up with the combine <laughs> as you're driving over it and then stop before the chaff in the back of the combine spreads anything into the pan. So it's kind of a, it's, it's very tricky because as you're shoving the pan underneath the swath, you may have to cover it. And then as you have it in proper placement, you pull a little cover, like a little blanket off. So you don't have any kernels dropping in already before you, you go in there with a pickup. But there is things we can discuss and there's things we can play with if, if, if that makes sense. It's definitely tricky, but doable. Yeah, okay, so Franco and anyone else with similar questions, um, I think at the end, if we haven't already, we'll share um, uh, Bushel Plus's contact information. All right, Sean, I wanna bring you in here for this next question, because I know within the Canola Council agronomy team, we've had discussions about uh, lifting, and Marcel, I'm gonna get to you as well on this same question, but uh, dropping versus spreading of, of, and how do you properly measure? So Sean, can you, help me out and kind of explain our thought processes on why we recommend the dropping. Uh, but I think we're starting to accommodate people who, who don't want to take the time to do that and, and are spreading. Can you help explain? Yeah, it's, um, you know, to do it the quickest and the most accurate just dropping is, um, you know, you get that one measurement, um, and you can get a pretty good idea of what, what's coming out the back. Um, you know, some, some equipment like my old, I mentioned I got a 94 combine. It's got a very large, heavy chaff spreader on there that it would take two people. And if you get it on perfectly, maybe you'll get it on in five minutes, but it could take half an hour. It just depends. So something like that, um, it, I'm always going to measure the spread just because I can't disengage that one. So um, for, you know, we, we say the quickest, most accurate is likely to, to drop it, but um, there are advantages to checking that spread as well. Um, this your spreads are always going to be even. It's not going to be a, if you're spreading 30 feet, um, your losses won't be even across that 30 feet. So it takes more time to take multiple um, measurements to to actually get that that proper um, amount. So um, just more time consuming um, and uh, a bit more of a spreading to to get that measurement. Do you, but do you think the the spreading option is there enough information gathered there? Um, relatively simply to be useful? It, it takes more time definitely to get um, those, um, you know, it takes more measurements across that. Once you, you get an idea of where your losses are and how that, that spread is, it's going to vary with um, conditions and seed weight and it's going to make a difference where that actual loss is across that spread. But um, it, it gives you a, a a measurement. I, I don't feel it's as accurate as the dropped um, amount, but it, it's it's definitely better than not doing any measurement at all. Um, and then it seems we've got a, a tool or an, an app that helps um, some of that precision. So you might want to comment on that. Yeah. I, I, so Marcel, there's two things on that that I want to bring you in on. Um, and I, I really like that if you if you drop. Uh, you get a real report card on the threshing and the pods. That was really an interesting comment because otherwise if they go through the, the chopper and spreader there, you don't know whether that uh, those pods actually were, <laughs> were, were uh, what happened to those pods. Anyway, yeah, you can comment on that if you want, but my question for you, I didn't really understand um, how spreading changes the wind physics. And I, can you, can you explain that a little bit more and why that's important? Yeah, 100%. And I apologize, I may have flown a bit quickly through that 
through that slide. But, but um, so you said already, dropping it in the windrow, straw and chaff helps you to see those unthreshed pods. But then when you go back into the spreading mode, and this again, really depends on the machine. There are certain OEMs that actually say already uh, on in their combine clinics that once you, once you go back to spreading, um, uh, once you go back to spreading that the, the wind physics that I'm talking about. So there's chaff spreaders in the back, there's a chopper and they have a, a certain suction. Again, depends on the machine, but there's the suction that can still take and help you getting chaff off the sips. In some cases it helps, in others it doesn't. And that's why you have to, it either helps you get the chaff off and the canola fall through the sieves or it pulls the canola with the chaff out the back. And that's why you have to recheck while you're in, in spreading mode um, to, to measure how you combine. Um, and we've like from different countries as well is, uh, Europe is a lot of checking and spreading. Um, Canada is a lot of checking with the wind rowing. It seems to be a little bit of farmer preference as well. Um, however, if you go to Australia, there's a lot of combines who can't even go into drop mode because they have uh, certain types of mills or chaff line systems on the back or, you know, different kind of tools, different kind of machines. And that's why we made that app so, um, so detailed that you can do one or the other. Um, certainly, totally agree with Sean. Uh, you have to take a couple more measurements when it's in spread mode. You, you cannot just take one in the middle. You shouldn't take one on the outside, take one in the middle. And in the beginning, play a bit with it and you may find your sweet spot where it always throws and that's what you use going forward. So if you reduce it in that area and you go and you have less kernels in the, tr in the tray or in the air separator on the scale, whatever you use, you're going in the right direction. So um, it's, you want to get away from looking on the ground, just, just judging it. And that's, that's one way to do it. Okay, we've got three questions, uh, including one of mine, so I'll save mine, but we've got three minutes. So we'll try to do one question a minute and then wrap up, Karina. Um, so Karen in Washington State uh, uh, asks, and this is a really good practical question. Do you recommend measuring going uphill, downhill, and a side hill? Uh, I guess they're in, they're in some pretty steep slopes there. Any recommendations on, on what kind of topography to do your tests? really depending on the combine but when we start thinking about this take an average of the field so what whatever represents the field the best so even in those hilly fields you you are better off trying to set up the combine in a flat area where it's where it's decent where you can set a benchmark for your loss sensor because once the loss sensor is calibrated on how many kernels are ticking on it then if you go if you go uphill if you go downhill you will you will have a correlation between how many ticks are on the loss sensor equals how many bushels per acre and how high is the loss sensor going so it means if you if you benchmark it in um and i hope there is a little bit of flat area i mean i grew up in the mountains in germany there's not much flat land there but uh you know if you have nothing at all um try to do it try to do it you know, whatever is preferable to you, like as in safety, I almost have to say, I know some of those mountains up there or hills are, are pretty rough, but if you, if you cannot be straight, go one way and catch multiple samples across. So I have the 60 inch pan and drop it all in the windrow. Um, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to do if you don't have anything that's a little bit straight. It will definitely affect your losses going side hill because ima just imagine the machine, right? Everything in the machine will go to one side and will overload one side of the sieves. So if you don't have a machine that has a, a, a sieve level kit in there, um, really tricky to do. If you have your sieve level kits or even those, those leveled combines, a whole nother ball game, you can measure on the side hill, no problem. Okay, we're gonna, Sean, I'm gonna give this one to you. Uh, actually, we got one just came in, so they're related. Um, and this has to do with canola varieties and differences in loss. Um, 
Uh, any suggestions for, this is from Boris, any suggestions for different combine settings when going from regular to pod shatter canola? And related, uh, do we see significant differences in settings, variety to variety, uh, like cultivar to cultivar? Um, so let, let's do the pod shatter versus regular canola. Sean, any any noted differences that you've observed? Uh, definitely, um, you know, you, you really got to watch in the, the threshing system. Um, as uh, Marcel pointed out, um, the pod shatter ones in the past, um, you know, almost anything would uh, thresh canola out of the pods, but now you've actually got to watch and make sure you're, you're threshing it out as opposed to that cleaning system. So maybe a little more aggressive on the, um, you know, rotor settings. Um, and then, and we talked about keeping a combine full in a year like this, um, when you've got a, a, a pod shatter variety, plus, um, you know, maybe you're having trouble keeping the material full. Um, it could make quite a big difference on, on getting that material out of the, the pods. Marcel, do you want to add to that? Yeah, very. I, I can second that. The other thing too is that uh, when we, if we're talking, if, if somebody goes from swath canola to now straight cut canola, is it is so different to set up the machine because a swath canola, if it's dry decent, it's thrashed out before it even comes up the feeder house and it really pulverizes in the rotor or the drum and then can tend to overload your sieves where with the straight cut canola, um, you know, it's it's tougher to, as Sean mentioned, to thresh it out sometimes. Tighter, tighter, more RPM settings could be helpful. That's why it's important to check. Um, and then the other thing with straight cut canola is it's possible that well, people were plugging up the back end of the machine with a chopper because they were running the choppers on high speed. Um, and sometimes you can choose different kind of chopper speeds so it doesn't create a wind that's forcing that little bit of chaff because I have a lot less chaff going through the machine now with those not putting those stalks in that the chopper was creating a wind that went up and was actually plugging it because the chaff couldn't fall into the chopper. So it's, it kind of floated up there and plugged the back end of the machine. So you have to be aware of your RPMs all the way from front to the back of the machine. Faster is not okay. always. Yeah, no, that's really, that whole wind uh, dynamics with the with the chopper spreader. That's really interesting. Um, and I think your point about you know if you're used to combining swath canola and you're trying out some straight combining, your all of all of your settings may need a bit of a tweak to make sure your losses are are within reason. Okay, so here's here's my last one, if you don't mind, Karina, uh, and this is for you, Marcel, and it's just a quick one, but. So everything's going smoothly in the afternoon. It's a hot, dry, good, good harvesting day. And then things toughen, toughen up in the evening. I'm just trying to get a picture of where, what can happen in that transition of conditions to losses. Like, can they go from one to 2% or could they go, could they be going from one to 10? Like, could it be, could it be way worse than people realize? Yeah, certainly worse um, because it's, there's, there's so many factors. I really have to think about these machines. If I, you have to think about it inside the machine. If I change one thing, what happens down the chain reaction? So short answer is yes, it can be worse. But if I calibrated my loss sensor properly, then I will see that spike. However, as Sean pointed out, you'll have to do it multiple times throughout the day to really get a feel for it, uh, to get used to this. Um, and it gets really tricky if you are combining towards the night or in the evening, it gets tough and you have some green straw yet and you're squeezing it through a tight concave gap and you're squeezing some moisture out of those stalks and that straw. And all of a sudden your little kernels are sticking to that straw that is just has a bit of moisture on it and it travels out the back of the machine without you seeing this on the loss sensor. So that's why it's important to check with those pans again and after a while, you get a bit of a feel for this. And that's why our app is so important to where you can lock um, your settings of a combine, you can lock notes. So when you have a scenario now and you think, oh, this worked really well, we should lock these and we should save these. So I can save them on the app and then next week or next week, you can go back to these settings and, and, and you reuse them. So you, you, it's not just a drop pen system, it's a system to learn more about your machine and the scenarios on your farm. It's really a, 
a tool to get to know your machine better. So it can be really bad at night for sure. Yeah, that record keeping is so key to, to having this information handy and uh, making proper settings year to year, day to day. Okay, I guess we better wrap up. Thanks everybody for sticking with us for an extra five minutes. Um, and Neil, Sean, Marcel, that was excellent information. Karina, I'm gonna throw to you. Right on. Well, thank you again um, to all of our panelists today and to Jay for moderating. Um, Leanne has just thrown up the CEU credit. Um, so for anybody that was wanting to uh, gather the CEU credits, the QR code is there now. Uh, the session has been, re been recorded. So if you're unable to join us live or want to um, tune back into a few different pieces, we will be emailing it out to everybody that registered for the, um, the webinar. And uh, in addition, we will be doing that draw um, this week for the Bushel Plus system for everybody that registered. And, and uh, so stay tuned for the winner of that. So with that, I think we'll sign off, but thanks again uh, for joining us today and uh, wish you all the best in the harvest season.